All right, so now we want to draw the actual phase plot for the overall transfer function. So as usual, we start with the asymptotic plot. So we said we're gonna be at minus 90 all the way to five. Then we drop to minus 270. Just notice one thing that here, the interval in terms of phase is different. Here we had one block that was my, uh, 90 degrees and here now one block is uh, 45 degrees. So it's a little bit more um, expanded. All right, so we stay at minus 20, uh, 270 all the way to 10. And then we increase, as we said, linearly till we hit minus 180 at 1,000 or 10 to the power of three. And then we stay at 180. Now, if we want to draw the, the actual plot, then we have to make it look little like this. So we incorporate the actual plot for the complex conjugate poles and for the real zero. And of course it doesn't have to be super precise here because um, there's only so much that you can do when you draw the actual plot you would have one way of doing it is just to use MATLAB, <laughs> of course. But then uh, when you use MATLAB, you don't really have the asymptotic plot. And sometimes just having the asymptotic plot uh, gives you a lot. And that's, you know, that's easy enough to draw. So, and you know, the more body plots you draw, the more accurate you'll become. And so it's just, once again, it's, um, it's a question of exercising. All right, uh, so we're done actually. The last thing that I wanted uh, to do is to compute the actual peak, which happens once again for the value of resonant frequencies, so for 4.95 radians per second. So in order to have the actual value for the magnitude, well, let's compute 20 logarithm of the magnitude of G evaluated at 4.95. Or in other words, we need to compute 20 logarithm of absolute value of four times, now the magnitude associated with the pole square root of one plus 0 0.01 squared times the magnitude squared over omega r, and then square root of oh, real part squared. So we have one minus omega r squared over 25, everything squared plus imaginary part squared, which is omega r squared over 25 squared. So 625. Now, just by substituting 4.95 in here, you get 12.2 decibels. So it's a little bit lower than the 14 decibels that was associated with only the two complex conjugate poles. Okay, I want to talk a little bit before introducing the phase and gain margin. Um, a little bit about the performance specifications in the frequency domain. So you remember the performance specifications that we talked about are the percent overshoot, the rise time, um, the settling time, and so on and so forth. When we look at things in the frequency domain, uh, there's a, another couple of um, specifications that are usually used. The first one is the actual 
magnitude of the peak. And once again, here we are always referring to a second order system as we did uh, when we introduced the percent overshoot, the um, rise time, the peak time and settling time. So we're still referring to the plot, in this case, the body plot for a second order system. And that looks like the following, as we saw. And this is, you know, again, the under damped system. So zeta is between zero and one. So the new specification that we're defining is the so-called bandwidth. So the bandwidth is actually the frequency, value of the frequency, at which the frequency response, so the magnitude, has decreased by three decibels from its low frequency value. Hmm, what does that mean? So if we have a second order system, then for low frequencies, it, its magnitude is zero. It, we come from zero and then we increase the magnitude up to the, the peak. And then we start lowering the magnitude for higher frequencies until you know, we go all the way to minus infinity following the minus 40 decibels per decade slope. Now, when we intersect the minus three line, if we start from zero, we're dropping by minus three. So obviously this is the minus three decibel line. Well, the intersection will be your bandwidth. Usually, you know, the bandwidth makes you makes you think like a, there's an actual band of frequencies. Well, yes, technically it's from zero all the way to omega b. But in order to find omega b, that is actually a, an actual frequency, a value, not, not a range, not a band of frequencies. So the bandwidth really means from zero all the way to omega b. Um, if you had a system that had a, a gain so that for lower frequencies you were not at zero, but let's say you were at 20, so your bandwidth would be the frequency at which your magnitude drops to 17 decibels because you have the gap of three. And you can, you can do that um, for almost all body plots, let's see if we can do it for uh, for ours here. Well, no, here not because um, at lower frequencies. So if we if we were to extend the magnitude plot all the way to omega equals zero, or the tens to zero, the magnitude would be infinity. So your bandwidth would actually be zero here or not defined. So it really makes sense to define a frequency, a bandwidth um, frequency if we arrive with a flat line from low frequency values. Okay. Uh, a little bit well, let's start with the bandwidth since we've talked about that. Uh, the bandwidth is related to the time, um, the rise time. So the higher the bandwidth, the lower the rise time. So for a faster response system, we want a larger bandwidth. So in the, in, in the example that we saw, although I said the bandwidth is zero, so you think that the, the rise time would actually be very, very large. Um, we actually don't know that a priori because once again, the bandwidth is related to a second, is defined for a second order system. So that makes sense only if our system behaves like a second order system. If it behaves completely differently, then it, we cannot really rely on the bandwidth to, to come up with um, the conclusion for the rise time. 
also we have that that the peak mp is related to the percent overshoot so that makes sense we also saw that uh, with the general response the higher the peak the higher the percent overshoot well that was kind of the definition of the percent overshoot it was the peak minus one over the value of the peak times 100. All right, so since they're both higher as the damping ratio decreases, we want a relatively small resonant magnitude, or in other words, we don't want a system with a damping ratio that is too close to zero because that would, that would make the, the peak very high and therefore the percent overshoot very high. Now I can give you a relationship between the natural frequency at the bandwidth that is valid for values of the damping ratio between 0 0.3 and 0 0.8. We have that the ratio between the bandwidth and the natural frequency can be approximated with minus 1.8. 19 times the damping ratio plus 1.85. All right, so here, my warning, as I said, that everything that I said here is valid only for second order systems, and it may be a good approximation of systems of higher order, but if and only if they have a pair of dominant complex conjugate poles usual things, nothing really uh, that different from what we've already seen. Okay, with that being said, I want to start talking about the relative stability. And in order to do that, I want to present you this uh, analogy here with the, with the sheet of paper. So the stability of a system, we relate the stability of the system with, with the page. So we can write inside the page, so between the edges, anywhere, and, and we're fine. We cannot go outside the page. Otherwise, you know, the information, whatever we write outside the page will be lost. So you can think about the page as the domain for your stability. If you write inside the page, your system is stable. If you write outside the page, your system is unstable. Now, if you, if you pay attention to pages, usually they have some lines to you know, left, to right, and also top and bottom. So these are the margins, right? Well, like, and why are, do we have margins? So just in case, you know, we, we are warned that we're close to the edges. So we, we might want to stay within the margins. And so of course, the, the, the larger the margins, the safer we are. We know that we're not gonna, most likely we're not gonna write outside the page. And so we can transport this analogy into the control systems and we can define the equivalent of this uh, vertical and horizontal margins in terms of um, the magnitude and the phase. So they're, they're actually called gain margin and phase margin. All right, so let's see what they actually mean in the context of control systems. So let's consider our usual control system with our lovely block diagram. So we have a controller and then we have the plant. Now, a lot of times, and you've seen that in the homework that I've actually called the product GC times G well, you didn't know that it was a product of GC times G, but you saw the letter. 
and I call this L. And so L is normally known as the loop transfer function. So pay attention, I'm not talking about open loop or closed loop, but first of all, because uh, here we have a closed loop system. But L of S is the loop transfer function, okay? So not the closed loop transfer function. And L of S is equal to GC times G, which actually, to be honest, it would be the open loop transfer function if we didn't have the feedback branch. Well, then your transfer function would just be L of S. But since here we're always referring to a closed loop system, then um, it doesn't really make sense to talk about open loop transfer function. So we have the loop transfer function and the closed loop transfer function as our usual T of S, which now can be simplified in terms of notation instead of writing over and over GC times G, we simply write L. So T of S is L of S over one plus L of S. All right, so nothing really, um, it, it's just a, a slight change in notation, introduction of a new letter. Okay, so now let's think about what happens when our system um, goes to infinity. So in terms of magnitude, T of S goes to infinity when its denominator goes to infinity. So if the absolute value of one plus L of S, sorry, goes to zero. And that happens when, when L of S is equal to minus one. So if L of S is equal to minus one, then one plus L of S is equal to zero. And therefore the transfer function blows up. So the response of our system just goes to infinity. So it makes the system unstable. So we want to, to be as far away as possible from minus one. So we want L of S to be far away from minus one. But remember, L of S is a complex number, it's a complex function, and you can always think about minus one as a complex number. So usual thing, we divide um, L of S equals minus one into two equations. We have the magnitude, so L of S magnitude, equals to one, or in terms of decibels, we have 20 logarithm of the magnitude of L of S equals zero because logarithm of one is zero. And then the phase associated with minus one is 180 plus N360. All right, so usually what happens is that for the loop transfer functions, we usually have more poles than zeros. So normally the phase associated with L of S is in the negative numbers. Um, therefore, we are really looking at the phase of L of S to be far away from minus 180 degrees. Let's go back to our example. If you see that the overall phase ranged from minus 90 to minus 270. So our alert line is minus 180. But of course that, you know, that can be repeated for 182. So not 182, but 182. <laughs> Or 180 also. All right, so 
once again, the problem arises when L of S is minus one. So the instability happens when we have both the magnitude that is equal to zero and the phase that is equal to minus 180. So they have to, these situations have to occur uh, simultaneously. And of course we want, we don't want them to occur simultaneously. We want to be far away from the situation because this is the, the represents the edges of our page. So we have two conditions, one in terms of magnitude or gain, sometimes, you know, the magnitude is called gain, and one in terms of phase. Therefore, we can define a margin in terms of gain, gain margin, and uh, a margin in terms of phase. And so the first one, the the gain margin will tell us how far away we are from zero when the worst case scenario in the phase has occurred. So when the phase is at minus 180, how far away are we from zero in the magnitude plot? That will be our gain margin. Vice versa, the phase margin is defined so that if we are already on the worst case scenario, gain wise, so if our gain is already zero, how far away are we from minus 180? And that will tell us our gain margin, sorry, our phase margin. So the body plot is really helpful in order to, uh, to, to see this thing. So let's redraw the body plots for the example that we found. And so we have that the gain margin, as I said, let's start from that, is, well, worst case scenario when in terms of the phase, so whenever the phase is 180, how far away are we from zero? So in this case, we're about um, maybe between 10 and 15 decibels. Okay. What about the phase margin? Well, we have to look at the worst case scenario in terms of gain. So when the plot crosses the zero decibel line, then we go and look cor correspondence to that frequency, how close we are to 180. So in this case, we are about 50 or 60 uh, degrees away from minus 180. Oh, that's great. However, there's a caveat here. Uh, we don't know whether the system is stable or not. The margins really make sense only if the system is stable. From the body plots, there's nothing that tells us whether the system is uh, stable or unstable. So before computing the gain margin and the phase margin, what you should really do is to uh, assess the stability of the system. So once you know for a fact that the system is stable, then it makes sense to compute the gain margin and the phase margin. If the system is unstable, well, you can, you can still compute them, but the, you, you can think about them as you know, how far away outside the page are you from being inside the page? So it's sort of a negative uh, margins. Okay. So another couple of definitions here, uh, the value for which um, or at which the value of the frequency at which the gain plot crosses the zero decibel line is called the crossover frequency or omega c. And that will be related to the phase margin. And 
the value at which the value of the frequency at which the, the phase plot crosses minus 180 is simply called omega minus pi. So it's the frequency at which the phase crosses minus pi or minus 180 degrees. And so that is related to the gain margin because at that frequency, you calculate how far off you are from zero. So let's write it down more properly. The crossover frequency, as I said, so omega c is the frequency such that 20 logarithm of your loop transfer function is equal to zero. So in other words, when we cross the zero decibel line and omega minus pi is the frequency at which we have that the phase of the loop transfer function is equal to minus 180 degrees. So the phase margin, which is just called PM or PM, you can, you can find both notations, is the difference between the phase at the crossover frequency, so for the worst case scenario in terms of the magnitude, minus, minus 180. So you wanna see how far away you are from that. Or, you know, also minus, minus 180, you can just add 180 to your phase. And once again, this definition uh, makes sense if you're, phase is negative. So when you add 180, you usually find a, a positive phase margin. The gain margin is instead defined as the difference between the zero decibel line and the actual value of your magnitude at the omega minus pi frequency. Or simply minus 20 logarithm of this. All right, so here, as a rule of thumb, you can say that the system is stable, usually, if you find that a phase margin is positive and the gain margin is also positive, then the system is stable. And, you know, the values of the phase margin, the gain margin will tell you how far away you are from, you know, potentially becoming unstable. And if you find instead that both phase margin and gain margin are negative, then your system is unstable. However, as I said, Again, you shouldn't really compute the phase margin and the gain margin if your system is unstable. So please first um, assess the stability of the system. And then if the system is stable, compute the, the, the phase margin and gain margin. A um, couple of notes here. Um, you not you don't have to find necessarily values for the gain margin and the phase margin. In fact, the gain margin can also be infinite or, or you know, not defined. And when is that? Well, if the body plot for the phase does not intersect plus or minus 180 degrees, or, uh, if the intersection or occurs at very low frequency, so for omega that tends to zero or for omega that tends to infinity, um, that's, that's when the phase plot tends to plus or minus um, or minus 180 degrees asymptotically. 
let's see if that is the case. Well, that's not really the case in our example, but if we had a phase plot that asymptotically tended to 100 and minus 180 degrees, then your omega minus pi would actually be plus infinity in this case. So just be aware of that. Same thing with the phase margin. Um, you might not have a phase margin if the magnitude plot does not intersect the zero decibel line, or it can be defined at omega that tends to zero or omega that tends to infinity if the magnitude plot tends to zero decibel asymptotically. Okay. So with that being said, let's go ahead and calculate phase margin and gain margin for our example. Now, some of you might say, okay, wait a second. You just said, first, make sure that the system is stable before computing the phase margin and gain margin. So why are we doing this? Oh, it's just because we want to do it. Uh, as you will see, the system, spoiler alert, the system is not stable. However, we can still compute these values. So let's start uh, with the phase margin. So in order to find the phase margin, we need to find the cross frequency, the crossover frequency first. So in other words, we need to solve this equation. And what is L in this case? Well, it was the same function that we had earlier. Earlier was G, we'll just call it L this time. Um, well, let me, let me copy it and paste it. Okay, so now we are assuming pretty much that our loop transfer function is the, the function that we had earlier. Okay, so what is the magnitude of such transfer function? Well, we have the magnitude of four, then the magnitude of the zero associated with the zero. So we already done that when we computed the, the peak value. So just going to go a little faster. All right, so this is the equation that we want to solve. And our unknown is omega. One equation, one unknown, we're good to go. Now, 20 logarithm, if we take the, um, or we can divide both sides by 20. Here is zero, here is one. And then we, we use the inverse function. So it's gonna be 10 to the power of whatever we went here. And this is 
10 to the power of zero. So 10 to the power of logarithm goes away. So we simply have four over omega. So whatever was inside the logarithm has to be equal to one. Now, if we multiply both sides by the denominator of found on in the left side, then we have four times square root of one plus 0 0.01 squared omega squared is equal to omega square root of one over 625 omega to the power of four minus 49 over 625 omega squared plus one. Now let's square both sides. So we have 16, one plus 0 0.01 squared omega squared equals omega squared. And then similar. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, skip a few steps, but you can find them in the notes. So we are left with the following equation here to solve. So we have a sixth order equation, which we cannot, definitely cannot solve analytically. So let's uh, use a Newton's method. Why not? So Newton's method, we have a function, and this is you know, f of omega, and that is our original equation that we want to solve. And then we take the derivative with respect to omega. So the derivative is six omega to the power of five minus 196 omega cubed plus one, two, four, eight omega. So remember here, we are trying to compute the crossover frequency. So we need for the Newton's method an initial guess that is quite close to the actual right answer. So we, we have some insight of where the answer might be. So let's look at the plot. We know that the crossover frequency is about here. So it's kind of close to 10. It's gonna be less than 10, but we can use, uh, let's say eight maybe. Why not? Let's use eight as our uh, first guess. And how do you find the actual solution? Well, you have to compute some iterations. So you have that the step, general step omega at k plus one is equal to the step and omega at step k minus your f function evaluated at omega step k over the derivative, so f prime evaluated at omega at step k. So starting at eight radians per second, you construct here the right hand side everything is a function of eight and you find your omega at step one, which is in this case, 7.13. Then now you substitute omega one, the right hand side and you find omega two. 
omega 2 in this case is about 6.58 and then do the same thing so 6.34 and uh, and then you pretty much converge at 6.295 so four iterations are enough in this case, because then the, the following will have the same decimals. So we found the value for our crossover frequency. So it's a little bit over six radians per second. Why do we do this? Well, our objective is to find the phase margin. So we need to find the actual phase of our transfer function at omega c, at the crossover frequency. So what is the phase associated with L? Well, let's do first one extra step. The phase associated with L So we have the phase associated with four. So our tangent of zero, because zero is the imaginary part of four divided by the real part, which is four itself. Then we had plus at the numerator, one plus 0 0.01 I omega. So our tangent of imaginary part is 0 0.01 omega over one. And then we had one pole at the origin. So minus, because now we are at the denominator, arctangent um, Let's see. Imaginary part is omega divided by zero. And then minus arctangent, whatever the phase associated with the complex conjugate poles. Now the imaginary part is omega over 25 over real part is one minus omega squared over 25. And so simply here, we simply have to use omega c that we found. And so we have that our overall phase at omega c is zero plus 3.60 minus 90 minus 156.71. That is equal to minus 243.5. Eleven. So fortunately, we're not at 180 or minus 180. So it looks like we have some margin. Looks like though. So we have minus 243.11 plus 180. That is minus 63.1. Oh, that is negative though. So not a good feeling about this. But you know, just for the sake of exercising, let's compute the gain margin as well. So in order to find the gain margin, we first need to find the frequency at minus 180. So we want our to, to find when the phase of our uh, transfer function is equal to minus 180 degrees. So using the same equation for the phase that we just developed, we simply have our tangent of 0 0.01 omega minus 90 minus our tangent of omega over 25 minus omega squared equals minus 180 or we can take minus 90 and 
to the uh, right hand side, we have arctangent of 0 0.01 omega minus arctangent of omega over 25 minus omega squared, that is equal to minus 90. All right, so here for the next step, we use the fact that r tangent of x minus r tangent of y is equal to r tangent of x minus y over one plus x y. So just also good review for uh, basic math skills. So we have r tangent of 0 0.01 omega minus omega over 25 minus omega squared over one plus 0 0.01 omega squared divided by 25 minus omega squared. That is equal to minus 90. So in order for the angle to have a tangent that is equal to, sorry, uh, we want, the angle is minus 90. So the tangent of minus 90 is infinity. So that happens when the denominator is zero. So we can simply solve one plus 0 0.01 omega squared over 25 minus omega squared equals zero. And so this is 25 minus omega squared plus 0 0.01 omega squared equals zero or 0 0.99 omega squared equals 25. And that gives us omega that is equal to square root of 25 over 0.99, which is 5.025 radians per second, and that is our omega at minus pi. So what is the gain margin? The gain margin is minus 20 logarithm of the magnitude of a transfer function evaluated at the frequency value that we just found. So if you plug in, the number in here, okay, you're going to find that your gain margin is negative, minus 12 decibels negative. And as I said, if you find that both your gain margin and your phase margin are negative, it means that most likely you're dealing with uh, a closed loop system that is unstable. But once again, before doing all this, let's say if I ask you in the final, uh, compute the, um, the phase margin and the gain margin for this system. Well, maybe the system is unstable. It's very easy to compute the uh, stability or to check the stability of the system. And so if the system is unstable, you can simply say, well, the system is unstable. It doesn't really make sense to, <laughs> to find the gain margin or phase margin. Okay. However, there's still something that we can learn from this. And that is, if we have our um, phase at minus 180, it means that we are 12 decibels away from becoming stable. All right, so you're 12 decibels off. So you're not 12 decibels safe, but you, you need to gain another 12 decibels in order to, to pass from instability to stability. And 
On the other end, if we consider the phase margin, that says that if our gain is zero, we need an extra 633 degrees, 0.1, to get your, our system in the stable region. And this phase margin is quite big. So, um, well, we'll learn how to, to deal with that. Uh, short answer, what you can do is simply um, multiply your overall transfer function by a constant gain. Try first with a constant gain that is uh, greater than one, and then maybe try with one that is less than one and see if your gain margins or your uh, phase margins become positive. But again, it would make more sense if you if you drew the root locus or if you if you found a, a range of stability or instability with this extra k that you can tune using, for example, the Raoult Hurwitz criterion. All right. So um, before finishing with the second part of the lecture, I just want to give you another couple of empirical formulas. And the first one gives you a, a prediction for the damping ratio if you know the phase margin. So this says that the damping ratio is going to be 0 0.01 times the phase margin. So it's going to be 1% of your phase margin when the phase margin is expressed in degrees though, okay? So if you have a, a phase margin of 100 or no, let's say uh, 60 degrees, then your damping ratio would be 0 0.6. You see, that's why you also want a positive phase margin because if you had a negative number, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, of course, this uh, has limitations and this is the following. This is valid only if you obtain values for the damping ratio that are lower or equal to 0.7. Of course, damping ratio has to be positive too. And also you can predict a value for the bandwidth if you have the crossover frequency and that is simply 1.6 times the crossover frequency. And once again, this is valid only when the damping ratio is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. These are not you know, they not, do not always work. These are prediction, but they might not um, be realistic. So now with the tools that we have, we can comfortably mm, calculate everything. And as a matter of fact, I also want to tell you how to, to visualize the gain margin and the phase margin using MATLAB. So you can use the function Bode for example, body of L, and then we'll give you, we'll open a window with two plots, the first one being the magnitude plot and the second one being the phase plot. That what you can do is you can right click either on, on the first one or on the second one, and then select um, characteristics And then you have three options. One is peak response, minimum stability margins, or all stability margins. Um, you can you can select all stability margins, for instance, and it will give you all the stability margins. Wait, can there be more than two? Because you know you, I've talked about a phase margin and gain margin. Well, yes, you can have multiple phase margins and 
and, and gain margins, depending on how many times, for instance, you're gonna have as many phase margins as the intersections of the magnitude plot with the zero decibel line. And you're gonna have as many gain margins as many times as your phase margin intersects or um, tends asymptotically towards minus 180. For instance, in our example, we have that the gain margin only crosses once the zero decibel line. So we're gonna have only one phase margin. However, technically speaking, uh, the phase margin intersects, yeah, one, the minus 180 line, but then it tends asymptotically to it for uh, frequencies that tend to infinity. But what happens with that, if you take a look at plus infinity, the, the gain plot goes all the way to minus infinity. So the, the margin would also be infinity. So yeah, technically speaking, you have two gain margins here. One is the one with the recalculated. So about, in this case, minus 12 decibels, and one is um, plus infinity. So usually you want to consider the minimum stability margins. Um, you, you have the option in MATLAB to calculate all the stability margins, but you're usually um, concerned about the minimum ones. So it's like, you know, to go back to the analogy of the page, let's say that the phase margin are the vertical margins. So you can have one margin that is about this one, this size, and then have a much smaller one on the other side. So of course, you're gonna worry about the second one, the minimum of the two. And the gain margin, you can do the same. You can think about the horizontal margin. So you, have, you can have two different gain margins, for instance, and, uh, but you're gonna worry about the first one being the smaller of the two. All right, so this concludes this lecture. And um, next time we're gonna see the design of the, our favorite compensators, that is the phase lead and phase lag compensator using the body plot. So finally, the term phase lead and phase lag will make more sense. All right, so this is all for today. I'll see you virtually next time. Take care.